Thank you. And so I'm already, so I'll actually, I figured, because you might not know me here. So I start with just a little bit about me. Um, so I'm already asked, what funny name is that? So I'm ready from Switzerland. My last name is Italian, so my dad is Italian. And I came here for grad school. Um, and so 17 years ago, and so I like it here. <laughs> and you can see a little bit why. So I came here for grad school to work in my cat fields lab at Kuala Marine Lab, and he studies marine um, invertebrates, and um, specifically larvae. And so this little guy you can see up there is Fistilla sibogi, a larva of little nudibranch, which is one of the model organisms in the Hatfield lab, and which he had uh, some funds for. So that was, I worked my first few years as a PhD student on that little, um, the little snail. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So while working, and I was able to go in the field quite a bit throughout the Pacific to collect samples for my research and other things, you know, they needed somebody, so I, who knew inverts, so I would be that person. And through that, then I started teaching. So I'm currently actually I work at the Department of Biology at UH Manoa as an education specialist. So I coordinate those big enrollment classes um, for the undergrads have to take the lab specifically in ecology and marine biology. And so I really teach, sometimes I say I teach through proxy because I teach the TAs how to teach the undergrads. And I try to do a lot of hands-on, a lot of field work. The ecology and marine biology is really easy to do that. And through that, with some friends at Kiwala Marine Lab, we decided we want to do more than research and teaching and do some science outreach. So we founded Kahikai, which is a nonprofit organization to do science outreach. And use visual tools, um, modern technology, or just photography to really try to engage and excite um, the next generation of, if you want, caretaker of the oceans. And through that, um, it's kind of hard to see, but any guesses where I'm here? This wood. Um, I'm wearing this little safety harness. So I'm probably on a boat, right? So I'm actually, this is, I'm on Hokulea. So this picture was taken in December, south of Cuba. So through our science outreach with Kaikai, um, we connected with the Polynesian Voyaging Society because they wanted to have some science outreach for their voyage to have lessons in port and at home in the classrooms um, to teach about the importance of the ocean. And I got lucky to go on Hokulea as a crew member um, over Christmas to sail from Miami to Panama City. And any, any ideas, what, what am I doing here? What, what, anybody knows what this is? Yes, so I got to get to do some plankton toes because through all of this, somehow plankton became the main theme and the, our focus. And I hope at the end of the talk, you will understand why. So this is just a little bit about me. So um, before I will show mostly a lot, a lot of picture, pictures. So just as I already said, Kai Kai, there's actually, there's four of us truly, two in Hawaii and two were postdocs here and they moved back to France and they are the photographers. So some of the pretty beautiful picture with that symbol on there are from them and they do outreach over there and we do it over here. So we try to you know, expand. Um, and then they were both, like Eric and Aldine, were both um, image specialists on this. I don't know if anybody's seen it. They came a few, actually, I want to say maybe eight or 10 years ago. They were at um, Aloha Tower. It's a French organization, Tower Expeditions, and they study the oceans and go kind of for different themes throughout the world. And um, together, we, they work together with Villefranche, which is one of the marine stations in the Mediterranean. And they founded this thing, Plankton Chronicle. So if you get excited about um, plankton through my talk, you can Google this, Plankton Chronicles. And they have lots of videos and pictures and really trying to combine science and arts to get people excited about those magical, the magical world. 
And most pictures I will show, they have like the little, as on my title slide, you saw the little ring. Whatever pictures were have a little, are in a little ring, a um, little circle, they were taken with these things that they're called cell scope. I have some here on the left side, you can look at after. And this is kind of our little visualizing tool because as many of you know, plankton are tiny, right? So we need a microscope and the spec kids or people, any actually adults who are not used to looking at plank in a microscope, have a hard time with microscopes. And it's hard to show, yeah, especially if it's live, I don't know, you see something and they're like, here, what is this? And I'm like, oh, where is it? Right, it's gone already. So with these, our little microscope, which instead of looking through, you look through the iPhone or iPod or iPad, and you can live take pictures and videos and show each other and talk about it. And so they were designed by my lab at UC Berkeley, um, the Fletcher lab, which originally designed those for diagnost medical diagnostics for um, you know, doctors in remote areas. So they could pick, I don't know, a sample of a blood sample and then send it to a hospital and have some diagnostics. And they realized actually it's a great outreach tool. So we are lucky to have a bunch here. And one of those is actually has been going around the world on Hukulea as well. And then, any ideas who this made? Well, it's written there. But um, it's hard to, you know, not talk about the magic of nature without talking about Ernst Haeckel, um, the German biologist who made these amazing things. And throughout, I'll have some of those just because they're so pretty. And they're from this book, Art Forms in Nature. All right, so a lot of talk. Um, but so plankton, why plankton? Well, for one, plankton is one of those funny terms. And I don't know, I don't, maybe you guys know, anybody know what plankton means? What does it, what does it mean? What's plankton? Yes, per, correct. So yes, so that's exactly what it means. So it comes from a Greek word planktos, which means drifting, wandering. And that's really, so it's one of those funny things, which is a specific, very term, everybody has plankton, but it includes like all these. Yeah, you see there's like little fishes and there is big jellies and there is tiny things. And most things, things are not at scale because these are little diatoms, little phytoplankton, one-celled organisms, which are much smaller than those fish, right? This is just to show the, di the huge diversity and those beautiful colors and forms and, you know, kind of the magic of plankton. And actually, the person who coins the term plankton is this guy here who I actually didn't know till recently, Victor Hansen. He lived at the same time as Ernst, Ernst Haeckel. They were both German biologists or those, you know, old school naturalists which were doctors and biologists and, and artists and, and everything at the same time. But he's the first who actually coined the term plankton and published it. And also the first who realized that till then, till him, his publications, people thought the productivity in the oceans are due to things coming from land. Just really um, anything, um, you know, rain a runoff really from land. Um, rivers or when it rains, etc. And here the first to realize, no, no, there is actually there are organisms living in the ocean um, who are the primary producers. So they are the driving force. And even though the mass is not as big as land plants, they actually produce, they're as productive. So estimates are at least half of the world's oxygen is produced by those little one-celled phytoplankton things. And so Heckel at the same time really got it, was getting excited about all things nature really, specifically if they're very um, symmetric and have pretty forms. And so he actually was the first to realize all the different groups which are part of the plankton. So the, and so for example, oops, he realized that there's diatoms, so one-celled plants. And a lot of like other groups, I'll show you pictures in a little bit, up to these huge jellyfish, um, that all those are part of the plankton. And he's also the first one who actually put, at least in writing, that some plankton, however, is we call it meroplankton. It only spends part of their lifetime 
in the plankton and then the rest of their life they're spending in you know the coastal areas or coral reefs etc so um the slide I skipped is really our banner we use for educational outreach and just to show the importance of plankton here as part of the food web but also as the life cycles of pretty much all marine organisms and how we have also an effect on that and we will get to that in a little bit later so here are those images I, you guys saw on the title slide earlier, but also who just um, are the ones taken on those little cell scopes, the little mobile microscopes. Um, and just kind of show some of the diversity, right? You have some, some blue green algae, is actually uh, cyanobacteria, so the pinnacle cyanobacteria, to one cell organisms like this phytoplankton uh, diatom, um, to this foraminifera, which is a one celled, um, like a protist to fish larvae, to barnacle larvae, you know, jellyfish, worms, all kinds of different groups. And so even though these are actually numbers, those one-celled uh, organisms and bacteria and numbers are very, very huge and very important. And as I said, um, already Heckel was very um, fascinated by them because they're so pretty. Um, I will mostly talk about the inverts and you notice I won't talk about the larvae neither. I don't know, some of you might have seen John Whitney's um, talk on fish larvae a month ago or so. So he actually was one of my um, TAs teaching for my classes. So it was fun to see um, him talk about the fish larvae. So I will focus on the, those organisms in the plankton which belong to the inverts. And really, so, you know, maybe you noticed they're very colorful, and also the, all the pictures so far I showed you are very colorful. Um, it's a little bit counterintuitive, because living in the open ocean in just water, where there's no place to hide, and you're little, and there's all these other things swimming around, if you're visible, it's, you know, you get eaten. The problem is here, there's a little bit of bias, right? So because it's just more fun to image very pretty colorful things. But really, if you do a plankton toe, this is more what it looks like. Right? It's just transparent. These are actually the plankton I, I did in that tow you saw me on Hukulea and south of uh, Cuba, right before Christmas. So it's pretty transparent, right? <laughs> pretty transparent. Um, I don't know what else do you see. I mean, maybe, I don't know, you notice there's a lot of long, like appendages, long things. Any ideas why there's all the long appendages and things? They can float better, right? So all those guys, is also plankton mostly, um, they feed on phytoplankton. Phytoplankton needs sunlight, so they need to stay up. If they sink, they die. So they have a lot of, so basically by having a lot of um, uh, appendages, and um, they increase the surface area and so that it makes it there they float better and sink less likely so more chances to survive um, the other thing i don't know if you noticed they're not very sharp because there were a lot of them and they were swimming around like crazy um there are all those guys this is not this is a polychaete larva little little bristle worm larva but a lot of those you see majority of those are these guys anybody know what these are a little long tail, maybe an eye, one dot, some antenna. Have you seen those before? So these are copepods. It's kind of the, it's amazing. They're actually the most common animal, most abundant animal in the oceans, but nobody ever heard about them. I mean, some have, but normally people don't know about them. And they're pretty um, numerous. They're actually at least 13,000 species of copepods. Um, which is pretty crazy. Um, some are in any aquatic environment, really, anywhere there's water they can be. So they could also be um, in, there are actually some also in uh, freshwater. There are some, they could be in some, just if there's a little bit of humidity anywhere, there are there, but the majority are planktonic. And here's just a little bit. And so all those pictures on the cell scope, I forgot to say, are all made from um, plankton toes here from Hawaii. So they're usually when I go with my classes 
Um, and there's plankton, I just took, take the advantage and use just the plankton to image. So it's just stay later, later to take all these beautiful images. So this is just, these are all just different copper pods and you can see just the diversity of them um, just right here. So one thing what you might notice is they don't have very good eyes, right? So there, here you see, this is a typical eye. This is a little bit atypical, like these lenses. Um, but there are some which have these kind of long lenses, strange eyes, but most have this one dot and it's really just sees light and dark. So they only see where's up, where's down. So you wonder if they are actually a predator. They're pretty racist predators. So you wonder how, how do they find their prey if they can't see? Well, well, they have, oh, they have actually, and it's kind of hard to see, but they have these long antennas and on these antennas, they have a lot, a lot of hairs. I know you can see it, it's hard because they're so transparent and thin. And so basically on those little, little hairs on their antenna, and actually maybe we can see it better on here. Here's another drawing from Heckel. You can see all these little hairs on antennas. They can sense vibrations and water flow. So basically it's, it's like, so they, you know, if, if you see they can, by doing that, they can see if something comes from the right or from the left. And they can, by taking up those currents of something swimming by, they use that to locate your prey. Maybe also what you've seen in pictures, I don't know, anybody knows what these are, these little funny bags on the side? They're egg sacs, so they carry their eggs on the side. I guess it helps for them to float, yeah? Stay up, not sink right away. Um, all right, there is another group I want to talk about. Oh, and maybe one thing I should say, the copper pots, together with this group, I want to talk about a little bit, are they stay, they call, we call them holoplanktonic. So they stay their whole life in the plankton. Um, so anybody knows what these are? What do they look like? Snails, I heard, yes, yes. So they are called, they're actually pelagic snails. So they're, they also call them pteropods. Um, or some of them, I have only pictures because they're smaller and fit in my little microscope. Um, shelled ones, the unshelled ones, are some which don't have a shell. They call them uh, usually the sea angels. Um, so they're snails and they, you know, they, they look like snails. They're a little idle shell, yes, some more than others. These are just a very long, yeah, and then a shell, this is like a flattened shell. As you can see, they're very transparent, so they're adapted to live in the open water. Um, they're, instead of a foot they can crawl on, you can see they have these flaps. We call them velar lobes, so they swim with those. Um, they're really large. Yeah, and the shell, of course, is thin so that it's not just transparent so that it's uh, not visible well, but it's also lighter. Um, so they can swim. Now, one thing I said I was going to a little bit talk about the effect we have, and one reason we do a lot of the science outreach and included in Nokolea's Malamohonua Worldwide Voyage, is to show that even though, you know, you might not see these things, right? When you go snorkeling, you don't see these guys. They're too small. Um, what we do has an effect on those little guys and probably more on those guys than the things we actually see when you go snorkeling. And for example, one thing they've shown which is already happening is, I don't know if anybody has heard about ocean acidification. So through global climate change, um, just uh, heightened, um, so that it, it um, adds the, the, sorry, the pH of the water is getting more um, acidic. And basically what that means for those guys which make their shells out of calcium carbonate out of the ocean, that they're actually already having a harder time to make those. Um, so and there's studies, so they're actually one of the study organisms to study ocean acidification and how that affects um, things like these guys. Well, or not, I just, I just really love them. They're just someday pretty. So I want to move on to another group, which is one of those loose terms. We, these kind of things, they look alike. We usually group them under gelatinous plankton. 
Um, again, plankton, one term, really meaning a lot, a lot of different organisms. And then gelatinous just really means, well, they don't have much shell, they're out of a lot of water and gelatinous matrix. But actually, if you look at this, so this is a little jellyfish and these are tinophores. Um, they are part, uh, they're in the base. If you look at the tree of life, the evolutionary, from evolutionary point of view, they're at the bottom, um, close to where the corals are. And then this guy, which kind of looks similar, is a salp. And salps are actually um, more, they're chordate. So they're closer related to vertebrates than to these guys. But again, it's an adaptation to live in the open ocean, right? So do we need to float, need to be transparent. Um, so that's what that is. Um, you might see they're closely related to tunicates. So I don't know if you guys know sea squirts. Um, so they're very closely related to sea squirts. And some of them actually can get really large because they make colonies, so they can be several meters long. Now, another one which is part of this gelatinous plankton, you might all know. Everybody knows what this is? Yes, Portuguese man So how many knew that that's a colony? All right, some of you guys know that. OK, that's great. Um, yes, so this is a colony of a lot of different polyps. Um, so they're part of the siphonophores, which is part of the hydrozoans. Hydrozoans I really like because I did my master's on them in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and we will talk about them in a little bit. So just to give you some idea on how they grow, I have the little video. However, the sound is not working. So, oh, sorry. Here's an example, another example of a siphonophore. Um, and you can see that each little element, if you want, is little... It looks like a bead, yeah, a bead on a string kind of thing. There is one polyp, basically, one zooid, um, they call it. And so the thing is, when we do a plankton toe, you, they are pretty large and they're very, very delicate. So when they get in a plankton net, often they fall apart. And then you have these pieces where we always wonder, you know, we do the question, guess the phylum um, game. And so, for example, it could look like this. And, you know, this is, yes, maybe, and maybe this is actually a larva of a siphonophore, so the beginning. But it's kind of hard to figure out, so it, took, it takes a while. Now, I wanted to show you guys a video on how they grow. Um, we don't have sound today, but that's okay. I will just try, do my best to, um, to just voice it over. Oh. Nope. Isn't that one? Oh, no, it's not that one, the other one. One. Yes, that one. Yay. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So, this is actually creature casts. Um, if you like little <coughs> model videos, they're pretty fun. Um, they come out of a lab at, at the Brown University, but the Casey Dunn's lab, but he was originally a postdoc at Kewala Marine Lab. So, you wonder why I'm talking to Siphonophores and here you show about plant. Well, the reason they just showed about the plant is because plants, I don't know if you heard, know, they have like areas where cells grow, they can make new cells um, as a plant grows. Humans don't. We develop, make all the different cell types and as most vertebrates when they're very young and then you just grow. And basically just to show that siphonophores and like many colonial organisms, marine organisms, have certain attributes which are more like plants really than animals, terrestrial animals we know. And that's one thing is for example how they grow. So we just showed basically um, like here and here there are areas where they can build new cells. And even as the organism grows and becomes older, they can make new cell types, which we vertebrates can't do that. Um, so and they're basically do like division of labor if you want. So there's some are swimming, yes, yeah, some are feeding, some are protection, and some are just gonads. And so 
as a whole, and so they're related to anemones and jellyfish, but as a whole, it's a colony which does kind of this division of labor. Even though they're little small polyps, and they can do that as a whole. So they kind of are like a super organism, if you want, like corals can be in some ways. And this just kind of show how um, those little cells, how they grow and how they develop. Um, and so just the different parts for swimming, some are, yeah, the green are the feeding polyps, the purple, they kind of grow and become larger. They're here for swimming. And I don't remember what she said here, but <laughs> it's okay. So just to give you some idea, yeah, how, how that works. Um, here, these are the ones who are gonads. So some have only sperm, some develop only um, the eggs. And so that's also one reason they can get really, really long. Actually, siphonophores are the longest marine animals, not whales. Some siphonophores can get up to 40, 50 meters, so 130, 160 feet long. So just to show that, yeah, they're like have different types of organs if you want, like in a vertebrate, like human body, but it's just divided up among different um, polyps. And I think that's, I think we can stop it right here. All right. So back to the PowerPoint. Um, of course, who was fascinated by the siphonophores was Heckel. And I think in his drawings, you can really see those different um, types of polyps and what they do. Yeah, and of course, there's usually one which has like a floating, like a bladder bear in um, the Portuguese Manomore, it's really, really big. Um, in those deeper ones, not as big maybe, but you just can see how they could attain really large size and they're kind of this one um, super organism. All right, now to one of my favorite groups. Um, these are part also of so they're related to the siphonophores, which are closely related to each other, but then very within the cnidarians, but they are part of cnidarians together with corals, um, anemones, uh, larger jellyfish. Um, and these, the picture might not be great, and one reason is they're very tiny, and we usually film them live, so they, they swim, and so it's sometimes hard to get a sharp picture of them. But they're really tiny, and what's really cool and what, why I got really, um, excited or, or passionate about hydroids is because they are, have a very complex life cycle. So this is um, a life cycle. Um, so we have, there's a little jellyfish, sorry, the pictures you saw. Um, they usually live in a plankton, feed, mature, and then they release the gonads like many other marine organisms, planktonic organisms, into the open water. And then after fertilization, they form a planular larvae, similar like corals do. Yeah, it's like you can see they look pretty much the same like coral planular larvae. However, now this planular larvae will settle somewhere and make a polyp. And that polyp, little polyp, like a little coral polyp, if you want, makes then from there grows a big colony. And that colony sometimes can be a little bit like siphonophores. There's, there might be uh, polyps which are only here really to feed and some are here like this one, a reproductive zoid to reproduce. And what then happens is um, the reproductive polyps will form these buds and there's different ways they can do that. And out of these buds then will basically hatch or butt off a little tiny juvenile um, jelly, the medusa, which then will grow and develop in this reproductive adult jellyfish. However, from this, there's a lot of variations. And one thing which I know you might have seen from other talks, one thing is that the reduction of things. So things are just kind of shortened. So in this case, there are some species of hydrates where what hatches really is just, they kind of bypass the juvenile medusa. The adult reproductive active already medusa hatches. In some cases, even that, the whole development of this juvenile and adult 
happens in here and they actually just release just going out at the polyp. And of course, one thing is, well, and who is the adult here? Is it the polyp or is it the medusa? Anyway, it's like kind of the chicken and the egg question, right? So I'll just leave it at that. Now, who has heard about the immortal jellyfish before? Anybody heard about the immortal jellyfish? It's been in the news a few years ago. Because, you know, we talked before in that video about the, how, for example, most organisms stay um, through when they're gametes, like the, when fertilization occurs as embryos, that's when they develop different cell types. And yes, there might be like siphonophores, they might have areas where new cell types can happen, but once the cell type is a certain type, like a nerve cell or, um, you know, a, a, a reproductive cell, something like that, then that's it, right? It can't go back. And usually to go back, what you need is, is sexual reproduction, gametes, and you go from there. However, and this has been actually found in a co-worker um, from the lab, I did my master's in in Italy. Um, and so they raised these, and this is a lab where they looked at a lot of those life cycles. Because one thing I haven't mentioned yet, as you could imagine, um, studying plankton and studying coastal areas and organisms which live there, or the, they use kind of different skill sets. So through time, even now, like the marine biologists in IUH Manoa are in the College of Natural Scientists, uh, Sciences, and the oceanographer, which are the ones who more likely study plankton, are in the, in, at SOAS, in School of Ocean and Earth Sciences. So, and traditionally that has been the case like that. And for hydro, hydrates, what that meant is there were different taxonomies of the medusa than they were of the hydrates, of the, sorry, of the um, polyp stage, the colonial stage. Now there are certain labs which started raising them so they can actually look, okay, which medusa belongs to which hydrate. While they're doing that, usually they do that in little finger bowls, little glass finger bowls. And you just feed them the little uh, sea monkeys. You can, you know, like you can get the eggs, just put them in so they hatch, it's very easy. And at one point they just forgot about this one of those bowls. They forgot a bowl. And they knew there was a little jellyfish in there for this species. It's called Turritopsis um, dornii. It's a little, you know, it was a little jellyfish. They left it in the bowl, forgot about it. And the next time they looked at it, there was this blob in the bowl. So, you know, their conditions weren't just really bad, right? Think about no water change, little finger bowl. Conditions weren't bad. And what happened is this this jellyfish basically went to the bottom and the cell, the crazy thing is the cell de-differentiated. So the cell de-differentiated and then this blob came out of polyp again, but they, they basically didn't go through that sexual reproduction, which usually is needed. So that's why it became famous because it's like immortal, right? So you could do this circle forever and it's the same um, organism. Um, so my friend, Maipi Amelieta, we were both in the same lab for our master's. She works at the uh, Texas A&M Galveston, and she studies now looking at the genomics, the genetics of, okay, you know, because it has something to do with longevity, is always something which humans has interested. So it's a pretty interesting. All right, so um, one more group I want to talk about, which is pretty common. Um, so these are polychaetes or bristle worms. And what's interesting about this picture is so that most of them we know as, you know, the Fetidaster worms and all the things they live, a lot of them live in the sand and the corals are voracious predators. Uh, but some of those, and most of those have actually have a larval, a planktonic larval stage, but some are in a plankton's adults. And some like this one, you could imagine is very transparent and flat. It seems like probably a good swimmer. So that actually lives its own whole life in the plankton. And then this guy is very interesting because it actually once lived on the reef or in a sediment or, and then secondarily became planktonic again. So it developed, it, it's, it's kitty and things became more bigger and flatter so it can swim better. These eyes got bigger and they usually do that to reproduce and often synchronized. Like, I don't know, you probably know all that the corals release their sperms like synchronized so that's more chances that sperm and egg mix and more chances for fertilization. So the same with mean, these guys, what they do, and usually it's one species or a few species, according to the lunar cycle, 
They make these, they call them epitokes. They're really here just to, they've been stacking up, uh, filling their gonads, and then they swim into the plankton together with a lot of the mothers, and they just release the sperm and the eggs, and then usually they die. And so I came across these beautiful drawings um, from a German artist. And so these are examples. This is examples from here, but these are examples from the North Sea. And you can see the adult and then how when they're ready to become these reproductive adults, they go up in a water column, their eyes are bigger, their, their kitty are, are wider, better for like kind of petals for swimming, and then they die. Now there's different variations of that. And we found actually one of those um, little one here. These, if you wonder what those stars are, those actually are diatoms. And so this slide shows, this is actually different, a little bit different. This is called a stolon. And what happens when an adult polychaete in this group, these I think are psyllids, um, they are, when they become reproductively active, so they start forming these, think about like a tapeworm, you know, tapeworms have these, these extra um, segments at the end, they release kind of similar, but they didn't stay full of gonads. They have actually eyes and a head, and then those they release up in a water column where they um, uh, reproduce. Now, this one, maybe you guys have, heard, have anybody heard about the palola worm? Yeah, you guys heard about the palola worm? The palola worm does something similar, um, except that. It, so it grows and then it also releases part of the back so the worm stays in the reef and then releases the back but they don't have eye they have only a, a little eye spot so I, they assume that they can so they can know where it goes up so because they all go to, um, swarm towards the surface i think it's a waning moon certain days like once or twice a year and every area and they're very very common in the south pacific so these are images from Manu Atu, from a researcher from France who studies the, the interaction of ecology and culture in Manu Atu and in Fiji. And look at this. So they at night, they're just like a fire just and some dry leaves and then just they collect them like because it happens once or twice a year and in every different place is different. And they're so important that they're part of their lunar calendar. So they're, they know that's when the polar worm is out and they have a lot of different dishes. Um, they also, there's a symbol for fertility and they make like dances and chants just for that polo worm. All right, so moving on to my favorite ones, which are the larvae. Um, so these are all larvae. So, so far we talked a little bit of mix, but a lot of things which are as adults really in the plankton. And then these are all in the plankton as larvae. Actually, 80% of all marine organisms that are coastal or living on the sediment have a larval, planktonic larval stage. So it's pretty amazing, yeah, if you think about it. So the plankton is not just, you know, the base of the food web or the marine food web and oxygen production and so many other things, but it's also really, if you think about nursery grounds for all the coastal um, and, and sediment um, organisms. So I will talk about a few groups. So these, anybody know what these are? This is probably, I don't know what this is. What does it look like? Yes, it looks like a praying mantis. It's a mantis shrimp larva. And that's actually a different species or younger, I'm not sure. So they are, so these are all decapod larvae. So the higher crustacean larvae, and you can see they have big eyes. Yeah, remember the copepods have just that little dot. So these have big eyes, so the little, the little uh, crab larva, there's a, just an earlier stage than this one. These are barnacle larvae. And anybody knows what this is? This keeps going, but I just didn't fit in the in the viewing. We have just one 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 magnification on our little telescope. So this is a porcelain crab larva. They have these long spines, so they basically it's hard to eat. Yeah, they, they can get stuck in the mouth, or the fish would just spit them out. And then these guys. Well, I give it away here, but but. These are some of those larvae. I mean, I think that's one of the cool things why I like larvae, um, invertebrate larvae is their forms are just crazy and often have nothing to do with the adults. So this is, yeah, a little juvenile brittle stars so are caught in the plankton, but they're just ready to settle. But its earlier form looked like this. So from this, you get to this. 
This is a little me uh, a stage for a sea urchin. This is like a juvenile sea urchin, yet it's like still, you know, like a few little um, suction cups. But then the crazy ones are these two. So this is the larva of a sea star. And this is a larva of a sea cucumber. Pretty crazy, yes? So, just to show that life cycle a little bit better, I have the second video. Yep, the one before. Okay, is that a little compressed in there? It's because they get stretched down. So, actually, the video will show you a little bit. You can see how the urchin develops. All right, so here we have the surface of an urchin. And so this is from the Plankton Chronicles website. And you can see all the little, the spines and the pedicillaria, which are the kind of defense mechanism. And then eventually it will release eggs and sperm. Eventually it's coming. And these are the pluteus larvae of the little Eiffel Tower, we call them off the urchins, so the little embryos, pretty gorgeous, funny swimming around. Um, so they, here we go. So here it releases the eggs, and then there's sperm. Here it is the sperm, and they can be triggered by lunar cycle is important, but also storms can release them. Um, so the fertilization happens, this of course in the lab, but you know. And then here we have the cell division, like any animal pretty much. Um, they develop, and you can see aren't they? these images are amazing. So if you want to see more of those pretty images, go to Plankton Chron um, Chronicles. So here they form the blastula, so there's a, they're hollow inside, and at one point there's the gastrulas right there. So the, basically that part of the cell goes inside, which becomes the um, stomach. And then the builds goes into this little pluteal larvae, the pluteus, call them. So from there, they develop, and the urchin actually forms, I think there's some images coming soon, the urchin forms within. And then basically when it grows, while growing, it absorbs all those spines. And then some of them have relief, they have some extra spines left. Um, you see, like, there's like three suction cups, and then this is like a bigger urge. All right. What's the real, real time scale on that? Hours. Single cell Hours. So, and I get to that in a little bit. So, here we go. Um, this is just a schematic, um, uh, an example of that little, you know, I told you guys about the model organisms in the Hatfield lab, Fistilla bogey. And if you've ever had corals in a tank, you may know about them. They're the ones who eat the coral, especially, specifically Paritis compressa. Um, they, instead of releasing eggs in this uh, water column, they actually make a little egg capsule, which then the little larvae hatch, and you see they still have a shell. And we call it, depending on the species and the conditions, they take, you know, hours to days to month. In lobsters, it's up to 12 months. They stay in that planktonic stage till they become, we call it, competent. When they're competent, that means basically they're ready to metamorphose and settle. And so somehow on, they got to figure out a way to find the right cues where they like to live as adults, right? Because most of inverts, they're small, some are sessile, so they got to be good at that. Right? So otherwise they just die. So on this part, plus think about, um, I don't know if anybody, I'm sure some of you have been tide pooling or look going snorkeling. It's pretty packed there. So I call it the white, the real estate is like Waikiki. So it's, it's packed, meaning if you don't settle fast, somebody else will, or you will be eaten. So this metamorphosis happens quick in hours. And so I want to just quick look at a few studies from the Hatfield lab. 
And one is this worm Hydroides elegans, so which makes these big mats. If anybody you have a boat, that's the thing, the tubes who grow on the on the um, biofouling, like a mess for the Navy. Um, so they, they get into these little larvae, and so you wonder what are they settling on. And they actually were always considered other generalized settlers, like all biofowlers. They just settle on bacteria. And maybe some of you guys, you might remember there used to be these lead paints and stuff like that you put on your boats till they realized maybe that lead is not good for everybody. But that definitely deterred those little larvae to settle. But mostly it would probably deter the bacterial film to form. Recently, what they've so they've shown by putting basically they they have little, they raise the larvae, they raise little um slides which so they basically put glass slides in their water table with a lot of things growing in them and they take them out at different days like one day three days after six or after ten days so you think that's the age of the bacterial biofilm on the glass slide and then they add little competent larvae to it and what you can see this is metamorphosis of larvae so you can see the older the biofilm the more of the metamorphose right and so what they actually found is when they look, these are looking at a confocal scope to, to actually count the cells of the bacterial film. The age, the older biofilm, the more bacteria. So it makes sense. The more settlement Q there is, so more settle and metamorphose. Now, one thing is what they figure out is that actually they're not general because it's actually specific bacteria, specific bacterial communities um, which actually trigger them. So, there is no such thing as general and specific settlers. It's actually they're just specific to something we can't see well. And it took us longer to figure out. Um, so this one, our little example, is Pastilla sibogi. As I said, this is adult, the egg masses, the larvae you already know. Um, there's, again, samples they did in the Hatfield lab. So we put, and that was actually the project I came here um, to do as a grad student. We put a little larva on a little pin with Vaseline, the stick of Vaseline, and put them in a little water flume so they think they're swimming, even though they're not. And then we just look what they're doing by adding a little to a syringe, a little flume of something. We use fluorescent dye, which is non-toxic, just to show where the fluid that plume is. And here, I know you can see this little, the foot is out, the velum is out. This is just filtered seawater, the fluorescent dye, they swim. Here we have coral inducers, so it's just water with parietes in there, standing overnight and then filtered. So it has something, the coral parietes compressed so it's out in the water. And I know you can see that and it, it retracted. Yeah, the lower retracted, it stopped swimming. So basically what happens is they stop swimming. What happens when they stop swimming? They sink. Yeah, so when they sink, and that's the same like just looking at images of trajectories of larvae, just filtered seawater, they just kind of go crazy. The moment you add coral water, they just all drop. They sink. So that's how they find. And actually, there is a grad now, a PhD student here, Raphael Williams. He's in Ruth Gates' lab. I know she was here just recently. Um, he did his analysis in Guam and found actually that different species of fistula have react to the different settlement cues of different species of even parietes differently. And they usually settle more on the ones they prefer to eat on as adults. Sorry, I'm a little zooming through here, but... Um, and I actually, even that is some of my PhD, so I showed that this is just a tree, and I know they're hard to read, but just think about it as a family tree. If they're very close by and there's no long these long black lines, then they're closer related than if they're like going through long lines, then they're apart. Um, here, what I wanted to show just is to show that the different species, like the orange or facilimental brachia, they're all closely related, no matter where they were collected from, Plow, Guam, or Hawaii. Yeah? This purple one, same. But then, until we get to this group here, there's two species from different places, but it's, um, it's a mess, look at that. It's, yeah, they're, they're very different from each other. And actually, when you look at it a little bit closer, you see that each, we call them a clade, each group. So each group of closely related organisms 
would correspond to one morphotype of a species from one location. Yeah, this is Fistula minor, morphotype one from Oahu, this one from Palau, this one from species one from Guam, except there's two groups of those two, species one from Palau. They're very, this is 10% divergent for this gene is like, usually we call two, 3% this is for difference for different species. So they're very different. Now, when you looked at them, what happened, they were collected on different species of parietes. So, and if we add to that, those guys actually don't have a planktonic larval stage. Those are among the few which hatch competent and settle right close by, which could explain why they then just specialize on whatever the mom ate. They like to eat better, also prefer to eat. And so they're more metamorphosed there more. And I am running out of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but I am also almost done. So I just want to hope I showed you that um, plankton might be invisible, but one, it's gorgeous and beautiful. And second, really, we need to pay attention to the plankton if you look at coral reefs or individual organisms, because the chances are at one point they live in a plankton or are affected by it. And then I hope I also showed you why it makes sense to use plankton for science outreach. Um, one, because we want the next generation to take care of the oceans and plankton are very delicate and fine and they're probably the first ones um, to be harmed. Um, and this is a little um, plug also, we were working with a high school Yolani student who made an app for us on plankton. It's free. It just, it had some bugs, but it fixed it. It's now, since yesterday. Is on the app store. So if you want to know more about plankton and you happen to have an iPad, I'm going to Apple Store. I can show you over there. I can show you also how it 